conference, so I wish you could feel how clean my hands are. It's pretty terrible. Uh, I hope everybody's having a good time so far, um, and uh, hopefully we can continue that in the next uh, 13 minutes or so. So, Ruby card, hypercard in Ruby uh, with an asterisk. Um, some of hypercard. Uh, as it turns out, hypercard was a very fast and really cool program. We'll talk about it a lot uh, here shortly. And, um, you know, I uh, really wanted to use it as a way to do sort of a different kind of Ruby project. Uh, so I'm happy with the progress I made, but, uh, you know, we're not selling any copies of Ruby card anytime soon. Okay, so I'd like to give you a brief but hopefully uh, historically accurate description of Hypercard. Uh, Bill Atkinson is the name of Hypercard's creator, uh, along with his team. Um, he also created Mac Paint uh, way back in the 80s. Uh, pretty visionary guy. He's still doing stuff, uh, mostly uh, wildlife photography now. I think he has a couple of apps on the app store. Um, he worked for Apple in that very pivotal time where they were, uh, you know, bringing out the Mac and the Mac Plus and really moving the computer to the speed. Hypercard is a hypermedia software system. Um, of course, we don't know hypertext. Um, hypermedia is just slightly less specific because um, you couldn't do intertext like in, in Hypercard. Uh, the idea was that you click on objects and it's going to be and stuff, so pretty close though. <clears throat> like you said there. All right, the whole paradigm of like a card was that you're creating stacks of cards, and um, a card could have fields and buttons and backgrounds and pictures and stuff on it, and uh, you could have a stack of cards, a collection of them. Um, sometimes the cards would all look the same, but perform you know different uh, data displays, such as like a like a Rolodex or something like that, or all of the cards could be totally different, uh, like the somewhat famous game Mist and YST uh, was originally made for Mac in uh, Hypercard, which is pretty crazy. Uh, the cool thing about Hypercard and the thing that uh, was really unrealized at the time is that anyone uh, from their own Mac could be a creator and consumer of content. Uh, this is revolutionary because, as we recognize now, the idea of creating and consuming content in the same platform is realized uh, most fully by the internet. Um, you know, make a website, look at websites. But uh, this is kind of pretty website days for most people. And uh, the idea that you know, you're taking the power of the computer and letting people create your own content, you know, as, well, as well as viewing other people's styles, is pretty, pretty neat. Uh, Bill said this at a talk uh, recently, well, maybe a couple years ago. Um, Hypercard was kind of like the first glimmer of a web browser, but chained to a hard drive. Uh, they didn't put any sort of network in, into Hypercard. And, um, you know, he said a couple times he lamented not pursuing that farther because beyond that, he basically built a little web browser. Um, you can create content, you can see other people's content. So the first version was published in 1987. Uh, at the time, the internet looked like whatever this is. I don't know. This is our internet. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm kidding, but the internet was mostly just a research project. It was rapidly expanding and, and turning into something that would become the consumer internet, but it wasn't there. Uh, Bill and his team and Apple uh, were ready to take that step uh, in the Step. 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 Power. Uh, so <laughs> So we have stacks of cards with hypermedia links. That sounds pretty static. It sounds like you put a button there, uh, it can link to like another button or something. But um, it went well beyond that. Um, Hypercard had some pretty powerful scripting features. Um, elements like buttons and card could have uh, user program skip, uh, scripts that were executed uh, when you click the button, and as well as other things. Uh, enter Hypertalk, which was a language created for Hypercard. <laughs> pretty unique for the time. Sorry for that caveat. I didn't end up getting time to write the uh, hyper talk interpreter. So we'll make do. I think I found a nice switch. Uh, hyper talk had transparent data types. You basically just type words. Uh, you didn't say this is a number, this is a string, or anything like that. Uh, there are no classes or data structures. 
things that you would write out uh, tended to look like this. Put the value of card field, some field, into the bar value. And um, it went well beyond that, obviously, but I think that's a good example. Uh, with this hyper-talk language, you can control cards, stacks, uh, even the computer itself, infamously, you could use Apple's uh, uh, telephone dial protocol to have your hypercard stack uh, on the phone. Um, I have a short little video here. I love this video clip, and it's part of a bigger uh, segment um, for both how dated it is now, um, how these guys were sort of interacting with this old computer. Um, I like old computer stuff. I watch a lot of videos uh, on YouTube of old software and things, and um, yeah, I just like to share a little bit of it. Button. You can see its script, which is its brains. This message box here, where we've been typing commands like find, mm -hmm. can do a lot more. It can do calculations there. You can, um, it knows about the value of pi, it knows all the math functions. It knows what the date is or what the long date is. Oops. Long. <laughs> so nobody <laughs> saw the time. Uh, <laughs> um, or you can give it little commands like go to next card, like that, and yeah, well. And if you look inside one of these little buttons, you'll see that its brains actually say go to next card. That's how that button knows how to use this. This is script for that button. This is how a, a customer reviews would uh, actually program. Yeah, so uh, really you just have a little box in every button or field or whatever. And um, I don't know if you can see it was a little green there, but you basically just have a little uh, block that said on mouse up, and you can type your sentence in there and, and it would do stuff. And um, the important thing to stress, of course, is that this is uh, way before a lot of these. Ruby came about and it was meant to be like using and stuff like that. A couple other things that HyperTalk or HyperCard did well. Um, saves were kind of happening in the background while you were editing stacks. Uh, this was kind of weird and it's still kind of weird uh, today. You know, we're so used to hitting uh, colon WQ or like uh, command S or something like that. But as you change the stack, um, it would just change and uh, it could actually lead to some funny results if you modify it. Like, Card, um, and then come back to it the next time and consult Washington. Uh, there was fast text searching, which was revolutionary for the time. It was a small book like Bill. Um, I don't really know much about bitmap packing, but it sounds really impressive, so I'm glad that he accomplished that. And uh, it also had graphics manipulation, which was another big piece of the puzzle for HyperCard. Um, Draw graphics, you could cut and paste uh, images uh, inside the stacks, which was uh, pretty astounding for the time. And uh, this is sort of what it looked like. You can see in your know, classic OS 9 interface here. Uh, this is the home card. It has some things, things like training and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I have a link at the end of the talk if you want to try out HyperCard. Uh, you can actually find it on the internet on. Uh, Okay, so now we have to talk about Ruby card. This is a project that I embarked on a few months ago um, while sort of formulating this whole uh, talk all together. My motivation was thus Ruby is designed to be human, uh, you know, to be a joy for someone to write, to sort of read like human speak. I was wondering, can Ruby be used to do scripting or, or other things besides uh, web development, like uh, scripting GUI elements, much like a uh, hypertalk? And then take it a step further, can, can we use Ruby to make the whole GUI itself? Yeah, we can. Uh, we can. That problem's been solved. The cool thing about Ruby being a very mature language, and that said, but it's approaching 25 years old, is that uh, there's a Ruby solution for just about everything. So, Ruby for GUI, uh, Shoes. Shoes is a GUI uh, toolkit um, that was originally uh, written by Python Stick. Here it is. And uh, there's actually a talk on Shoes. This was not planned at all. Um, it just happened to you. I chose to use Shoes, and, and Jason is very passionate about Shoes. Uh, so I would highly recommend that I go to see that talk. Tomorrow, he's going to talk about how they're moving to um, from native implementations to using uh, 
at GDM. So that's pretty awesome. Okay, so a couple more things about my motivation here. Uh, Ruby's fun to write. I like writing Ruby. Um, sometimes I end up not liking Ruby when um, I have to write a lot of professional Ruby. Uh, I know this is like, this sounds kind of like a, you know, I'm being flippant about my work or something like that, but um, I really just like doing <coughs> hacking for the sake of hacking. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes we don't get to do that. Uh, so let's do something totally different. I mean, you know, we can really do bad things along the way. So we sit down, you know, um, I'm kind of wearing shoes, I'm messing with Ruby, I'm having a great time, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, I wrote the monolithic, like, giant Ruby file, file full of stuff. But, uh, <laughs> It's somewhat hard to navigate. Um, I wanted to break the rules, I did it. Uh, I have no regrets, but um, there's a reason why we try to encapsulate behavior and separate concerns and all that fun stuff. I will look at a couple of snippets of this later on, but um, just as a warning, if you if you go off the beam, uh, Jack and I fall off the side of the mountain. Um, what's that? Just kidding. Seriously, just. You know, sometimes it's nice to have fun. Okay, so hypercardisms. Uh, let's get right to it. Uh, stacks of cards. We can do that. Here's a stack. Um, it has a name and it has cards. We've all seen something like this before. Uh, we have a card. Uh, very similar. I tried to do like a funny little thing here um, where you could either pass in a hash or a collection of Armenian state objects. Um, you know, just one of those little Ruby things that, that uh, you see sometimes. Uh, that little constantize method there, um, I didn't really feel like writing that, so uh, one cool thing about Ruby and the way that it runs is that you can just steal the things you want. So I just copy and paste the data back to support. You probably wouldn't have to write that. Um, you could do that just about anything, really. Just open up the active model app and support stuff. Uh, fields and buttons, these are our primary interactors. Um, we can do that too. Uh, here's a button. It's a little small up there, but you know, it's not too much. Basically, you can instantiate it with a bunch of attributes, and it has this one thing called uh, method sim here, and that's kind of weird. But the reason I had to do that is that I actually have two different button definitions. Uh, again, the specifics aren't that important, but I found out using shoes that if I wanted to create a widget that was like a button, um, shoes kind of overloads their widget class, the instantiated in a way that makes sense for shoes, which means that it wouldn't really work if you just want to create a new version of it. Um, so I ended up with sort of this weird like uh, model and view where uh, my cool button is my shoes element. Um, and uh, my model is just buttons, so it's funny how that turned out. Um, I guess I could have really hacked it together to, to get all these things into one, but um, it worked well. Okay, so moving things around is also important. Uh, one of the big things about uh, hypercard is that when you put it in the field, you can drag it around and size it uh, the same with buttons. Um, you can do that too. Shoes provides some of nice little um, interaction in your box or click. It'll give you the button that was clicked and the coordinates. So once we have that, uh, we can write a method uh, called assign element that basically takes your viewport, um, looks at all of the elements, and then finds one that is underneath your mouse at the time. I imagine anyone who's familiar with, uh, you know, like doing this kind of like Canvas stuff in JavaScript. Um, uh, you know, in Java, uh, it's familiar with sort of looking for things under the mouse pointer. It was sort of new to me, so I was, uh, I had some fun doing that. And then our final piece for moving things around is uh, this block that's now pretty small. Um, it's not super important that you can see all the lines, but uh, when you're moving something around, you don't want to be able to drag it off of the screen or resize it out of the screen. So uh, you can look at your uh, card holder and uh, see if there's Amazon. 
Um, pretty mundane code, but it was fun to fun to write and fun to mess with, and very satisfying to get right. One more thing we needed was button scripting. Um, as I said, I didn't get into uh, HyperDoc or Hunter or anything. But we can do our best to do like a nice little um, thing in place of it. If anybody saw this line from one of Jimmy's slides, um, it's a string that has some Ruby in it, so I imagine we all already know it. Uh, instancy valve. I never use it for anything really, but it's pretty cool when you just put a string in there and it runs it like Ruby, which is a lot of fun. Um, and surprisingly, it, it works. Like, I don't really know how the internals work, but you know, it's a good research project for the teacher. Also, I don't know what this does, but yeah, I'm sure it probably doesn't actually work. I don't know, it might. I've, I've never tried it. Um, and then finally, we have graphics, uh, cut, paste, and, and drawing and stuff like that. But unfortunately, the, the best laid plans um, just didn't have enough time to get to it. Uh, so hopefully, in the future, in Ruby Dart version 0.2, we'll have graphics and uh, Ruby Talk or whatever it is called. So let's say action oriented saving instead. Uh, this was kind of fun. We have saving methods. And whenever we call save, we want to go to our current card, grab everything in the card, serialize it, and then uh, just write it to a file in JSON. And I was really wanting to do like a very complicated, um, like writing out kind of data bits or in the way that HyperCard originally saved things, but this is much easier. Um, and uh, it produces something like this, which our program can then interpret later on. Uh, all right, so it's time to take a look at HyperCard. This, like that, go over here and grab a Ruby card and put it right here. So this is what it looks like um, on startup. This uh, Ruby bit here would be sort of like the home of the stack or something there. Though. So let's go ahead and create a new stack and let's call it uh, RubyConf. And we have a bunch of tools and a bunch of buttons. So for our first card, uh, let's just say something nice about uh, RubyConf. So let's grab a new field. Um, this paradigm that I haven't explained yet about um, the hand versus the button and the field. Um, HyperCard made it so the hand was the interactor and uh, the other two options were sort of like the modifiers. So if I want to modify this field, um, yeah, this field modifier. Uh, we can double click it and uh, we could give it a name, we don't really need to. Um, hashtag or And we can go ahead and size and then actually hide the border too to make it look nicer. Uh, have to resize that a bit. And then uh, we can add a button. Looks like that. I'm going to select my button tool. Down here. And uh, here we have a script. Right now it just looks high. It doesn't really do anything useful. So uh, I have a couple of internal methods to find. Um, you can see the source of those later if you want, but for now I'll just type it in there for say next card. And we'll um, execute. So we go back to the hand because we want to interact with the button, but uh, nothing's happening. Well, we only have one card, so um, I guess we need to add a card. So we'll add a new blank card, and we go to previous, and then hit next. We go to our next card. Um, you know, we can do the same thing here, uh, add some more text content, whatever we want to say, but why don't we do something cool with the scripting real quick? So I have nothing to do here. I have nothing to do. This first field we will call uh, A. Go ahead and put it out of text. Um, go ahead and give this a little size. Save. Uh, do the same, we'll call this one B. Let's go ahead and put text. Some, some larger size, save. 
script, um, I'm not going to try to type it out because I know I'm going to make a mistake, so I'm just going to copy and paste, but I assure you I should write this. So we'll put this in here, uh, def calculate, we'll say element named a dot x, and element named is another sort of convenient that we can dive define to say uh, Okay. Uh, well, let me just describe this quick in case the building's going to burn down. Um, so, element name is just a convenience method I wrote uh, where it looks at the viewport and it grabs the thing that's named whatever you want. Um, we're going to instance eval what we find in there and we're going to set the result uh, to our other element. So, we're going to hit click save here, we'll go to our interaction, and we'll say uh, 1 plus 2. And then we we'll calculate, and we get a three. So we've now basically emulated that scripting ability to a certain extent. Uh, but he's a Ruby, and we're all Ruby, so that's totally fine. Let's add one more button here, just to show you that it has one other interesting feature. Um, we'll click that, we'll go here, we'll do this. And people are cutting in the hallways, so um, anybody feels it necessary to join in here and hear me. Uh, we can actually shell out to the user group. Um, so, go with the other part of my user. So let's just go ahead and say, and then uh, add into color.txt. Save that. Go ahead and click it. Um, I'll have to come over to my new year. Here's color.txt. And here's the how we wrote. So we actually have a lot of capability with Ruby that uh, I could talk to users uh, back then, um, you know, just more oriented towards Ruby programs. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. We have fields and buttons. Uh, we can move them around. We can resize them. We have, everything we do is saved, uh, and we can like open up that file later. I guess I can shoot that a little bit. If we go to open stack, so we save it and we come here. If we open it back up now, like a fresh open, um, all of our stuff is still there. And that's really great. So um, we sort of have emulated that feature, and uh, we have our scripting as well. And uh, it's all right in, in Ruby uh, with shoes. So we can go ahead and round out the presentation here. <clears throat> Fun takeaways uh, from this. Sometimes we get sort of in a rut with our programming, especially when we're working like 10 hours a day, 9 hours a day, uh, you know, stuff that needs to be um, precise and well tested and, um, you know, highly scrutinized. We can step away and we can use our love of Ruby and do something interesting. Games, music, uh, desktop apps, uh, making art. There's another talk, um, if you guys have like a working time machine, uh, you can go back to this morning and see uh, this talk about um, Ruby 2D, uh, or you can just watch the video later, I guess. But I'm um, assuming that looks really good. Uh, I took a look at that website right now. It looks very interesting so far. Uh, there's a bunch of other Ruby tools that you can use that are kind of like Ruby Motion, and there's a cool trick and stuff, and Google, and uh, all kinds of products. HyperCard is a really cool piece of software, and not just HyperCard, but the history of computing is littered with Google uh, pieces of software. And um, one of the things I like to do is just sort of, um, you know, try and uh, do research, uh, watch videos, read, you know, books about just the way computing has evolved over the years. Um, and I would encourage you to do the same, maybe just pick out one interesting piece of software or hardware component from, from history to do some research about it. Uh, these two links are, um, the first one is the archive.org link where you can actually fire up an old map and uh, use HyperCard. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And uh, Sheep Shaver is a Mac emulator that you can run locally on your computer. Uh, so if you want to create a you know, customized version of OS 9 to write all your spreadsheets on, um, 
I don't need your help for that. It takes like 20 minutes to set up, but you do it. Side projects expand to fill the space of their container. Um, I learned this uh, by the way. I've done some stuff in the past, but never with any um, sort of time limit, so just kind of working on it when I felt like it. Uh, the time crunch became very real with this project. Just the snacks. They brought out snacks. Okay. Oh, it's the snacks. Bad <laughs> please. The source of the alarm has been determined to be false. The source of the alarm has been determined to be false. Thank you for your cooperation. All is clear. Awesome. Uh, the snack alarm. But the snacks are not false, right? They <laughs> The snacks are real, but so they're dead. Get yourself some. We can do it all uh, in a second here. Uh, the thing about uh, working on a side project under a time crunch is that um, there's never enough time. And uh, you saw, you know, I sort of failed to get a few things done for Ruby Card for this talk. Um, you know, there's always tomorrow and next week and next month, but um, my recommendation would be, uh, you know, if you have a time box uh, amount of time to, to make something really. Scoop it down. Uh, fun takeaways, part two. Uh, we're in New Orleans after all. Uh, if you're feeling constrained by your day to day coding, uh, this is what I was saying about, you know, we want to produce really great quality code for people that pay us to make code, but uh, feel free to break the rules when you're sort of hacking in your own time. Not everything has to be 100% tested or 100% encapsulated. You can have a great big uh, monolith file. Um, really well for programmer happiness here as opposed to you know, shippable code. Um, the other thing is that JRuby is pretty amazing. I've never used it before, but kudos to those uh, people who made that because um, the newest version of Shoes uh, uses JRuby, and it was bonkers. Just calling Java methods and classes and stuff directly from Ruby, it, it kind of blew my mind. So, like that add listener there, that's a, a, a Java function. Um, pretty crazy. Here's one that I did in, in one of my classes, and basically, I had to go into the SWT widget to extract uh, font size data. And um, you can kind of all you can do it all from, from Ruby, and it's pretty impressive. So if you haven't checked out JRuby, uh, definitely do that. Uh, here's a picture of the dashing of Bill Atkinson uh, at a young age. Uh, I just like that picture. So uh, that is the signal that I have run out of slides and things to talk about. Um, I appreciate you guys listening, and if you have any questions about being bad at programming, I would 